Welcome to Indian Writers Forum. Today we have with us a uh, former professor of SN Banerjee, political science uh, professor of Calcutta University, Professor Shobhanlal Dattagupta. So we are very happy to have you today, especially you. in the centenary year of the October Revolution. Uh, I would like to start asking about the uh, method you have used to study these leaders, especially of late, the method of, biograph of approaching them biographically. So, how, how do you go about this method, sir? Uh, yes, uh, uh, the biographical approach I think is now very important uh, because of the availability of new materials, especially archival materials, many unpublished sources which were not available earlier. Uh, the essence of the biographical method, the way I uh, look at it is something like this, that when you are reading uh, some standard published political texts, then you just without focusing necessarily on the political text itself, if one goes into the background material which went into the making of this text and that background material in the case of biographical approach primarily refers to letters, diaries, reflections, notes which were never available officially. So, that way perhaps uh, if one, if I, I give an example sir, like this, say you want to study uh, Lenin's say some standard political text on the Russian Revolution, say State and Revolution which he wrote, uh, which he wrote when uh, he was actually underground uh, just a few months before the Russian Revolution. If we want to study the meaning of this text, the state and revolution, then perhaps it would be extremely helpful if one simultaneously uh, tries to see the how, what kind of uh, reflections Lenin made on the approaching revolution in Russia, say in the form of letters, in the form of any notes, in the form of any diary, in the form of any conversation which he had with his colleagues in the Bolshevik party but which were never recorded in the official text, State and Revolution. So, would you call your method as historiography? Not necessarily historiography, but uh, I would call it a sort of biographical approach. That is, that is, you, you study the feelings, the impulses, uh, the sentiments uh, of a leader uh, uh, in terms of his subjectivity. How subjectively he reflects, he or she uh, reflects on these things. In order to study the objectivity of the text, if you study uh, these things, that is the subjective dimension of the author, which is never recorded, which never is uh, actually acknowledged when one writes the political text, because, because the political text is meant for the party, mm -hmm. for the organization. But here actually you, you are right, uh, reflecting very subjectively and you never know that uh, it, it will ever be discussed. It is your absolutely personal thing when you are writing a letter, when you are writing a page of a diary. So, that becomes essentially personal. So, uh, how have you used this biographical method to study Rosa Luxemburg? Yes, I, 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 sh I should not claim that I have made a study already, but uh, I am trying to study. Uh, this requires um, one uh, little bit of explanation. Actually, Rosa Luxemburg's writings, they are primarily available in two parts. Uh, they are all in, have been uh, published from Germany. One part is her works. Works mean primarily the political texts, of, political economic texts of Rosa Luxemburg. We are familiar with many of these things which have been translated, not all of them, but some of it have been translated into English. But there is another very interesting thing about Rosa, that is her letters. Letters of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, they are available in German in six volumes and that work all again is not yet complete. Uh, two more volumes are expected to be added to these six volumes. Now, if one studies these letters of Rosa Luxemburg, then that is highly suggestive, highly suggestive in the sense that Rosa's letters are reflective of the mood in which uh, she is writing. Rosa's letters are reflective of the context in which she is writing and these actually provide completely new dimensions to the 
uh, study of the official political texts which Rosa wrote. You have made some interesting findings from what you have studied so far on Rosa Luxemburg. If you could give us some insight into that. Yes, uh, I will give you just uh, uh, one or two examples. For instance, Rosa Luxemburg was uh, extremely uh, skeptical of and he was uh, uh, very, very strong in her uh, under understanding of this question that is bureaucratism in the German Social Democratic Party. Then say very stereotyped kind of approach adopted by the Social Democratic Party in regard to different questions which it had to encounter. Then say uh, uh, the I I issues like, like this that is the Re Russian Revolution itself, mm -hmm. the approaching Russian Revolution, Rosa at that time was in prison. So, she is reflecting on the Russian Revolution. Now, in the letters actually, which she perhaps cannot do in an official text, but in the letters to her friends, very close friends, she is very strongly rebuking the General Social Democratic, uh, uh, the SPD, the General Social Democratic Party, Party for its bureaucratic attitude, for its very callous attitude, for its very routine like understanding of the party. And when she talks of Russian Revolution, she repeatedly refers to one thing that is from Russia what we have to learn from what this German Social Democratic Party learn, has to learn is how the masses are moving into action. That is two things are repeatedly coming up in her letters. One is that is down with bureaucracy, down with parliamentary routinism in the Social Democratic Party, down with this bureaucratic attitude of the Social Democratic Party which is absolutely lifeless, which is absolutely bookish, which is absolutely rigid. So, down with all these things and up with what? Up with intervention of the masses, mm -hmm. consciousness of the masses, subjectivity of the masses, how to energize the masses. Mas the masses have are already energized, but how the party can, can connect with the masses. Mm -hmm. so, but, but these things are there in her political text, but in the political text the language is completely different because, because, because you are addressing say a particular you have a target group, mm. it is meant for the party, it is meant for the organization. So, there actually the language is completely different, but in the letters so she is she has ap act actually opening up so far as her uh, reflections are concerned. She is uh, quite impulsive, uh, at, at times uh, extremely lively, at times very, very spontaneous. So, these things are coming up. Uh, to study Lucas might have been maybe a little more uh, uh, convenient, right? Because he's actually recorded his own life towards the end of his life, he's written a record of his yeah. life. So, yeah. was, it, was it any uh, different studying Lucas? Actually, in Lucas's case, I think the, uh, the case is much more uh, complicated and much more interesting. Uh, but be before that, I, I should like to point out one thing uh, that why I uh, relate Lukács and Rosa Luxemburg, because there are certain common things shared by the life of Rosa and life of Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg was there in the general social democratic party, uh, but she had to li live a life of exile virtually throughout, throughout her life. She was in Germany, she originally was from Poland, he, she hailed from Poland. She came to Germany, she went to Vienna, she went to Russia, she went to England. So, she was moving throughout Europe. Lukács also originally was from Hungary, but she had he had to leave Hungary because of repression, political repression. So, he had to shuttle between Germany, Germany Austria, uh, Russia and Hungary. So, it was like that. Lukács like Rosa Luxemburg was extremely skeptical of the kind of bureaucracy, kind of mediocrity which characterized the Hungarian Communist Party of which he was uh, the member right from the very, very beginning. This is another thing, but th these reflections of Lukács to a large extent like Rosa Luxemburg, these reflections of Lukács on the Soviet regime, on the Hungarian Communist Party, on the state of things which he, on his state of suffering, on his say, uh, notion of anxiety 
on his concern for the future, these are all reflected say in as you are have just pointed out, yes in his uh, long taped interviews which he gave to, to Hungarian scholars uh, at the end of his life between 1969 and 1971. These are reflected in a set of three conversations of Lukács with three German scholars, it is called conversations with Lukács. And one small thing, in Georg Lukács actually left, uh, but it was unfinished, incomplete, a 59 page typescript in German, he wrote it in German. Uh, it is called Galeptes Denken, that is lived thoughts, lived thoughts. So there actually many of the sentences, many of the episodes, everything is there, but it is incomplete. So so, almost wrote an autobiography. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it, it is called a sort of auto, autobiographical sketch, but sketch, mm -hmm. it is not complete. Okay. Because of age, because of his illness, he could not complete it. And so if one combines this incomplete autobiographical sketch along with his conversations, along with his record of life and in uh, as far as I remember that was in 1967 I think, 67 or 71, uh, he gave a long interview to a, a famous British journal of that time, New Left Review and there the, he responded to a lot of questions. So if one uh, looks into and there Lukács opens up very frankly he opens up, he says everything, he discloses everything uncompromisingly. So if one looks into all these materials, then a new version of Lukács in a biographical mode, a new version of Lukács comes out. Lukács was initially a man of aesthetics and then he transforms into a man of politics. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has a lot to do with his critique of the Communist Party? From his, uh, he's not a, uh, he wasn't a man of masses initially, nor was he a man of uh, academics, so to say, theory. So he transformed from uh, aesthetics to politics. I would not fully agree with what you are saying for the reason that yes, Lukács originally, he, he uh, makes it very clear in his uh, reflections, in his um, uh, record, um, uh, recorded interview, that yes, I, I started my life initially with aesthetics, I had nothing to do with politics. But my transition to revolutionary politics through the uh, my association with the Hungarian Communist Party right from the very beginning, at, that was about 1918. Uh, well, it actually between the two there was a mediating factor, that is between aesthetics and politics there was a mediating factor. That mediating factor was my concern for ethics, my concern for morality. Right. So, and that was an issue which uh, uh, which which actually was a running theme theme throughout my life. What is, I was not just interested in politics, I was concerned in a kind of politics which is morally right. So this transition from, uh, as you are, have pointed out, this transition from aesthetics to politics, it was mediated through ethics. One other leader I would like to ask about, though it, I mean he's written a lot and he's done a lot of work of the revolution is Bukharin. So Bukharin has written a lot on prison also. on. Uh, uh, and, uh, on, on not a life of happening life, but while he was in prison. Um, so uh, how, how was it studying Bukharin? In the case of Bukharin, it is very, very interesting in the sense, uh, very interesting, very innovative, very novel I would say, for the reason that we knew about Bukharin, Bukharin's uh, published writings, etc. Uh, but now Bukharin has become very, very important for uh, say two reasons. One is we did not know that when Bukharin was arrested in 1937, he was executed by uh, the Stalin regime in 1938. So during his stay in Stalin's prison in Moscow between 1937 and 1938, he actually prepared, they were, they were never meant for publication, but he prepared like Antonio Gramsci. So he prepared, he wrote say a several prison manuscripts. One of them is a historical novel uh, that is he com completed one novel. The other was a manuscript, it was called Socialism and its Culture. 
The third is a philosophical text. It was called Philosophical Arabesques. Fourth is a huge thing that is uh, hundreds, I have forgotten the exact number, hundreds of I think about, about 600 or something like that poems he wrote. And one another was a very small unfinished uh, notes. Uh, it is not, not very clear what he wanted to uh, write. So, these things were in the Soviet archives, they came out after the fall of the Soviet Union and all of them have now been translated into English, they are all available. And what comes out of these things is and that is why I would say in a biographical mode one can read because, because they were written not for the party, they were written not for the public. They were written by Bukharin perhaps for his own consumption because he, he did not know what would be the fate of all, all these things. So, it was say, say for his own satisfaction, for his own intellectual satisfaction. He wrote all these things say in order to complete what he could not complete in his own political life. And that way I would say in these writings if you ask me that what is, what is the significance of these prison manuscripts of Bukhari? There you come across and I thank you very much for raising the question of Bukhari because uh, Bukhari's prison manuscripts, these actually indicate that there is a very interesting connecting link between Rosa's writings, Bukhari's writings and Dukas's writings. In Bukhari's writings, you, the, you, there is no direct reference to the Stalin regime because he was writing in Stalin's prison. So, there is it was ob, ob, quite it is quite obvious he could not openly refer to Stalin and question uh, Stalin, but in a roundabout way he is writing. And two things are very important in Bukharin's prison manuscripts. One thing is that Bukharin is in an oblique manner. Bukharin is referring to bureaucracy, bureaucracy, mechanical understanding of life, stereotype approach to politics, stereotype view of socialism, stereotyped understanding of what should be the image of man under socialism. This is one thing. And he is questioning the way these things have been handled by the party, these have been the way uh, these things are being say conceptualized by the party, by the established re regime of, uh, of USSR. This is one aspect. The other is, he is like Rosa Luxemburg, like Georg Lukács, he is focusing on subjectivity of the masses, spontaneity of the masses, plurality, diversity, difference that you, you, you cannot, socialism does not mean the production of a man well will be uh, will be follow a particular model. You, socialism means opening up of diversity, diversity, plurality, we have to recognize difference and socialism means opening up of the potentiality of creative powers of man. So, socialism will unfold all these things, it has to unfold, it should unfold after 100 years of the Russian Revolution, yeah. a lot of the archives of these big leaders have come out and they are giving a lot of space to study them or at an individual level. So, it is really great to have had you here for the interview. Thank you sir. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much.